Well, those are the magic words. The recording has started, so we'll be able to send uh, a copy of this to those who registered if they're not able to attend at this moment. And uh, you'll get uh, a copy of the recording as well. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for uh, agreeing to celebrate Easter with me, Easter week. This is uh, the most important uh, feast of uh, Christian life. I asked uh, some of my uh, confirmation kids, I said, what is, uh, why is Easter important? And they kind of look at and I'm kind of puzzled because they think as culture has taught them primarily in terms of bunnies and other kinds of things. I said, uh, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything in history. And they look at me and uh, it's almost like it's dawning on them. So we have to continue to keep appreciating the importance of the resurrection in our teaching and our preaching. So uh, let me uh, share our screen here for an opening prayer. If you would join with me. Oops, no, we went uh, too far there. Uh, Lord God, in your eternal mercy, you sent your son Jesus into human history so it might see and enter into your kingdom. Jesus died and rose to open for us a future of love and grace. He sent the Holy Spirit upon us that we might begin to participate in the kingdom by living as disciples and working for a future of greater love and life. Grant that we may be open to the future you are always creating for us and that we might be faithful to our role of serving your kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, one of the embarrassments that I have is um, I often can't remember the title of my book uh, because uh, it's been changed and morphed in a variety of ways over the two years I've been thinking about it. I don't know if it's uh, spirituality of the kingdom, discipleship for the future, or spirituality of discipleship, a kingdom for the future, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these are the four key ideas that I want to explore. Uh, and I think that these have been embedded in our Christian and Catholic tradition uh, since the beginning. And I think that there's a lot for us uh, to gain by thinking of these concepts and kind of reprioritizing them. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, uh, maybe an image I wanna put in your head or two images I wanna put in your head. Uh, it dawned on me um, maybe about 12 years ago that a Catholicism is not a box in which everything is neatly organized, even though we like to put it that way, you know, we put out documents and uh, various doctrines, et cetera, as if everything is neat and tidy and the, and the words there. Uh, I, I'd rather uh, invite you to think about Catholicism as a big bag. And inside this bag are 2000 years of the work of the Holy Spirit and the experiences that believers have had to the presence of Christ. And what we kind of do is we reach into this bag and we pull out those things that are kind of central in our life at different points. And, and I think if you look back at your own spiritual journey, you'll see that at some points you were pulling certain things from your Catholic faith and at other points you were reaching maybe deeper to pull other things from your Catholic faith. So that's one image I'd like to present, the image of uh, Catholicism as a big bag with lots of things inside of it, lots of things that can be very helpful and essential for people. The second idea I'd like to uh, present is the idea that uh, Catholicism is like a piano and the doctrines of the Catholic faith are like notes on the piano. And of course, those notes are there and they're fairly well-defined 
and we have uh, whole notes and half notes and all those other kinds of things. But once you have those notes, there are lots of different songs that you can play. And sometimes uh, Catholicism has been down at the deep end of the keyboard and we're playing very somber and still and uh, trembling notes, if you will. Other times our notes can be a little higher on the keyboard and they're much more lilting and lyrical. And uh, so Catholicism is a set of doctrines that can have very different kinds of, uh, of emphases as we look at history. And, and this is an invitation for us not only to think about history, our personal history and the history of uh, spirituality in the church, but to uh, look at uh, the ways in which we kind of incarnate Catholicism at this point in our life, the way in which spirituality is vital for us at this point in our life. Um, by the way, at the end, we'll have time for Q&As, and you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that will say Q&A, and you'll be able to ask any questions or make any comments that you want at that time. Uh, and this is part one. There will be part two, which we will do two days from to now on, on Thursday, because the uh, content is uh, kind of diffuse enough to require uh, two different days. So um, I ended up writing about spirituality. And uh, for most of my adult life, I, I really didn't like this word uh, because it's one of those words that kind of uh, is can go anywhere, it, you know, it, it seems to have a content, but not necessarily a very clear content. Uh, and, you know, I, as people give me books, the spirituality of golfing, not that that helped my golfing game anymore, the spirituality of fishing, or the spirituality of Italian cooking or things of that sort. And, and so I, I kind of looked at it as a kind of uh, a nice word that didn't necessarily have a lot of content. But as I reflected about this, uh, I've kind of settled on this. Spirituality refers to the assumptions, attitudes, and behaviors associated with a certain vision of life, and more particularly, a vision of life connected with some reality like God. And uh, if we think of it as assumptions, and attitudes and behaviors, we can distinguish uh, spiritualities. You, you know, in our own church, we have different spiritualities like Ignatian spirituality, which basically comes from Ignatius of Loyola or Carmelite spirituality, which comes from the Carmelite community, various kinds of Franciscan spiritualities, et cetera. And, and we can see that uh, uh, the visions, the, the visions that they have at the beginning uh, really end up shaping a lot of the way in which they end up interpreting life and looking at life. And so uh, I'm inviting us to look at the assumptions and the attitudes and behaviors that can come about if we make one fundamental shift. And that fundamental shift is this, to put the kingdom of God at the center of our contemporary Catholic Christian life, just as it was at the center of Christ's life. That this word kingdom of God, which so often in uh, a lot of Christian history has meant, you know, this state that will come about sometime in the future and we'll be sitting on clouds playing harps, etc. cetera. Um, no, no, no. The kingdom of God is the power of God emerging within our own everyday experience. And it is the power of God bringing creation to fulfillment. That if we think about the kingdom of God as God's ultimate desire, God's ultimate will for all of creation, and we are part of that will, and we are part of bringing that will about, then we end up with uh, assumptions and attitudes and behaviors that I think can be very helpful and very important for today. Uh, so uh, I, I point this out in the book. I said, if there was any place that uh, uh, in Jesus' life, I'd like to be there. Um, you know, some people would like to 
be there obviously at the crucifixion. Some people would be there, like to be there at the resurrection. Some people would like to be there when he multiplied the, uh, the, uh, the bread or changed water in the wine. I guess I would like to be there for that one too. Um, but um, this little part that's in Luke, uh, when Jesus goes to his hometown, and, and, and I think it helps give us a, a little insight into the spirituality of Jesus himself. Jesus unrolled the scroll and he found the passage where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Now, that's a quote from Isaiah the prophet, uh, near the end of uh, Isaiah the prophet, uh, chapter 61. Then it says, rolling up the scroll, Jesus handed it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were looking intently at him. And he said to them, today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your very hearing. All spoke highly of him and were amazed at the graciousness that came from his mouth. Um, that's the, the, uh, the first part of this section in Luke. Uh, those of you who uh, read the scripture a lot will know that it goes on in just a few more sentences they start complaining about Jesus and who does he think he is? And we know his father, we know his relatives. He grew up right next door and they kind of want to push him out of the synagogue. So uh, right in the beginning, Luke is, is talking about uh, the place that the kingdom had in the imagination and spirituality of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, claim, proclaiming liberty, to people who are captive, giving sight to people who are blind, letting the oppressed go free. This is a spirituality ultimately of liberation. And um, this spirituality is what Jesus does. It's what he teaches. It, it, it's, it's at the heart of who he is. So what is, uh, what is the kingdom involve? Accepting God as a loving father, proclaiming good news, especially to the poor, healing people who are afflicted, struggling, striving for justice for humankind, freeing people who are imprisoned and trapped, including people who are excluded, demonstrating the forgiveness of sin and the power of forgiveness, giving life to the dead and doing all of this while abiding in prayer and trust and love. Uh, so during the pandemic, I, I started to think about this, you know, how could we articulate what the kingdom is about? And, and these are, you know, just general ways that a lot of it is uh, the language of the scriptures that we, we have, uh, so the scriptures themselves. But there's different ways in which all of these can be extrapolated in our own personal lives. Um, there's lots of ways people are afflicted. And there's lots of ways we can help them. There are many forms of injustice. There are many ways people imprison themselves, etc. cetera. And, and, and so it becomes a vision of, of how we continue the ministry of Jesus through the spirit that he has given us to continue the works that he began. And, and so uh, Jesus enacts the kingdom in his ministry toward others as an effective sign of fulfillment. So uh, that passage about what the kingdom is, is really the way Luke organizes the behavior of Jesus. And all the gospels talk about what Jesus did and how he did it. They have different visions about this. So in John's gospel, they talk about signs, etc. cetera. But uh, what is Jesus involved in? He's involved in healing, in forgiving, including, inviting, 
proclaiming, dying, rising, and praying. That all of this is the way Jesus enacts the kingdom as a sign of fulfillment. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, obviously, uh, there were a lot of blind people at the time of Jesus. But when Jesus heals a blind person, he's doing an act for that particular person, clearly. I was blind, but now I can see. But he's also doing something that says what God wants to do for all people, that God wants to give sight to all people. <coughs> and the same with healing, and the same with including people, the same with forgiving people, that Jesus wanted to demonstrate in his action a different way in which we are called to be. And that different way we're called to be is the kingdom. And it's embedded in the very basic prayer that we say as Christians. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So uh, the death of Jesus <coughs> And the resurrection of Jesus are part of this bringing of the kingdom. And, and I'll have a lot more to say in, on Thursday about the different spiritualities, but I just wanted, wanted to point this out, that the death of Jesus is uh, the fancy word theologians use, eschatological event. It's an event that shows that time is coming to completion that the kingdom is arriving. And uh, in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 27, you see all this apocalyptic language, which we don't really pay a lot of attention to. Behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. That the end of the end of time, the resurrection, the fulfillment of all creation is beginning in a different way with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we are inserted into this eschatological event. We are inserted as believers into the kingdom of God, which is being born. And so um, there's lots of ways we think about the death of Jesus. And, and I'm inviting us with this perspective of the kingdom to think about it this way. His death was not merely an act of Jesus' willingness to suffer on behalf of humankind. It was a willingness to enter precisely, to enter death, precisely to reveal the resurrection and show the scope of humankind's future. That the dying of Jesus was not something done in a sense to correct the past so much as something done to open a future for us. Uh, think of Jesus' own attitude uh, toward uh, his death. Uh, in Luke's gospel, he's already shown how Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem as an inherent part of the divine project, the kingdom that he was going to accomplish. When the days for his being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus saw ser uh, serving the kingdom as part of his destiny, destiny, part of what a prophet must be ready for even if that destiny involved being rejected and being assassinated as he was. That there's something he was called to fulfill in Jerusalem, and he was going to fulfill that, and his death would be part of the fulfillment. And we also have in Luke, a little further on in the gospel, I must continue my way today and tomorrow and the following day. It is impossible a prophet should die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, 
How many times I yearn to gather your young children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. So, so th there's this vision that Jesus has. In Jerusalem, he is going to fulfill his role as prophet. He is going to fulfill his role of speaking on behalf of God and revealing the heart of God to humankind. And this would happen through his death and his resurrection. And, and so this brings us a, a, a slightly different perspective from the way many of us think about the death of Jesus. Jesus indeed dies because of our sin, but not fundamentally because of some notion of justice that God must adhere to, as if Jesus God did not know about mercy. My son must pay the price for everybody's sins. No, Jesus dies as the revelation of God's reconciliation with humankind so that he can open a future that humans foreclose for themselves. That what sin has done, and of course we believe in original sin, this is a, a distortion from the beginning. What sin has done is close off the future that God is bringing about in our lives. And Jesus enters this history of sin and goes through the consequences of sin, death and destruction, so that he could bring us to the other side, so that he could bring us to a restoration of creation so that it can come to the fullness that God has intended. Uh, now, what, one of the implications of this is we have lots of images of Jesus suffering. And, uh, you know, when we go through Lent, uh, it's obvious with uh, all of our devotions are focused on the suffering of Jesus as if that was the point. Uh, the point was not the suffering of Jesus, awful and terrible as that was. The point is the death of Jesus that leads to resurrection. You cannot, as a Catholic, talk about the death of Jesus without also in talking about the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Catholicism is not one long unending wake in which we mourn for somebody who died. Catholicism is a celebration of the death and the resurrection of Jesus through which the Holy Spirit comes down upon us as Christ empowering us to continue our mission. That if we put the kingdom at the center of our lives, the way it was at the center of Jesus' life, then it is all a process to bring about this fullness that God wills for us. In rising from the dead, Jesus shows and gives humankind God's vision of the future, a vision of unrestricted life and deep communion between people and between all people and God. And Easter morning is the first dawn of this future for humankind. A new way of living, a new way of relating, a new experience of life's fullness. That is the experience of the kingdom. And that is exactly what Jesus opens up for us through his death and his resurrection. And so, uh, as we think about the future, I think modern science helps us. Because modern science, uh, you know, we have, we've had all these big fights about evolution and, you know, shows about the, the uh, Scopes trial and all this other stuff. Uh, but basically, modern science is saying everything is interconnected. Everything is in relationship to everything else. Life and new life emerges from and transforms matter. Jesus' life is an evolutionary step forward for all of human experience. That evolution shows the emergence of greater and greater complexity in life. And this greater complexity in life allows for greater capacity, not only to know, 
but also to share and also to love. And this greater capacity comes to its clearest evidence in ourselves. We are evolution thinking about evolution. We are what the matter has brought about through the work of God in time. And so all of time is driven forward by this providential love of God that Jesus reveals to us. And it's made active in our lives through the Holy Spirit. The resurrection gives all of existence motion into the future. Now, if we think about evolution, we see that through these tiny incremental changes as they think about it, and in a way being giving birth to other being, giving birth to other being, and a greater, greater intensification and complexifying a more uh, complex reality that emerges. So that, you know, we, we say, well, you know, did we come from chimpanzees? Well, that's a crude way of saying, but we came from the life that was before us, and we are pointed to a life that is coming about in and through us. And so God is bringing this future about through the work of the Holy Spirit, drawing all of creation toward a fullness, which we call the kingdom of God. Evolution gives us a model by which we can see reality moving forward through an interconnected process, which lead to higher levels of consciousness, communication, and union. Evolution can be an image for the way we think about the kingdom. The kingdom is the way God is using evolution to bring humankind and all of reality to fullness. Now, some of you who maybe have done some reading in various kinds of religion will say, well, that sounds like Teilhard de Chardin. And yeah, it does sound a little bit like Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and he was this, uh, this great imaginative Jesuit who was uh, primarily a paleontologist, but who was looking at the emergence of life and, and, and looking at all of these things and trying to think about life theologically from the perspective of evolution, from the perspective of human life moving forward into a future. And uh, he's given us a, a, a lot of uh, imaginative images of, uh, of humankind and human experience, but so many other theologians have done as well. So in terms of our thinking about spirituality, what are the assumptions, attitudes, and behaviors associated with a spirituality of the kingdom? Well, the assumptions, God has entered a world of dynamic movement in the incarnation of Jesus. God entered this world in Jesus, not as a rejection of the world, not as a condemnation of the world, but to transform the world. Jesus' death was part of the mission that he had of revealing the kingdom of God. Jesus' resurrection ties his history and death into the future. Jesus lets us share in this future through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, his risen spirit in us. And spirituality is about the future and our serving that future to bring it about. What are the attitudes? Well, as uh, Pope Francis would say, <laughs> We don't live as if we just came out of a wake. We don't live as sour pusses, people who are always thinking about death and sorrow and suffering or what have you. I mean, those are there, but we live in hope. We are always looking forward in hope. And we live in trust because we have already begun living this kingdom. Christ has already begun this in us. And we live empowered by the divine grace that is the power of God inside of us, lifting each other up on our journey. We don't journey alone. We journey together because we realize that we are all interconnected, interconnected with each other. And what are some of the behaviors? There is no cross without resurrection. 
you know, we were doing the Stations of the Cross during Lent, and I was saying to myself, well, who's ever done the Stations of the Resurrection? Why, why are we always focusing on how Jesus died and not focusing on how he rose from the dead? That was the point of his dying, how he rose from the dead and changes history as a result of that. All of humankind is invited into the kingdom. No one is excluded because Christ's flesh is risen and Christ's flesh is the flesh that all humans have. Our reaching out in service, especially to the poor and the broken, defines our lives because this is the way that we bring the kingdom in greater clarity into the world. And the sacraments and the virtues and ways of life are all ways of participating in God's future. And we'll be elaborating on those uh, uh, a little bit later and a, a little further on. And, and so this is the kind of vision of holiness that, that uh, I'm proposing. Holiness is allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us as disciples of Jesus Christ. So we give glory to the Father by giving ourselves to his mission by forming ourselves through the scriptures, the sacraments, moral vision community, and the social vision of Christ's living community, the church. This is what holiness involves in living as disciples and living as disciples, knowing that the Holy Spirit is using us to bring about a greater human reality and we do this as members of a worldwide community of love with the perspective, the scriptures, with the sacraments, with all of the moral traditions, with our great social teaching, with all these visions that we have that are basically shaping the future. So holiness is participating in the Paschal mystery of Jesus in which he gives himself in selfless love and complete trust into the hands of his father as part of carrying out his mission. It was so clear that what we read, uh, the passion of Luke, uh, the, uh, not the one we read on Good Friday, but the uh, Palm Sunday reading this year, uh, Jesus' last words, according to Luke, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands, I give over my spirit. And this self-gift, this giving over of himself, leads to the resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit upon believers. That his death is theologically connected to his resurrection, and his resurrection is theologically the bestowing of his Holy Spirit upon humankind so that his mission can continue, so that his mission can continue to be fulfilled. And so uh, we all belong to the kingdom of God, and this kingdom is brought about through discipleship. <coughs> Excuse me. In the Synaptic Gospels, the kingdom is revealed in the actions of Jesus that show the eternal love of the Father through mercy and healing. In the rest of the New Testament, <coughs> particularly Paul and John, the kingdom is shown by the way disciples live in Christ Jesus, experiencing and showing mercy and healing. That the synoptic gospels, the idea of kingdom is dominant, in the rest of the New Testament, the idea of discipleship is dominant, but they are all talking about the same phenomenon of living for others as a sign of God's presence, mercy, and grace. And uh, we'll elaborate this a little more on, on Thursday, but the virtues are the way in which the kingdom becomes real. Because what is faith? It's the transformation of our minds because we are now seeing the world through the eyes of the kingdom. 
Hope is the transformation of our imagination and our energies because we now know where things are directed. <coughs> Love is the transformation of our actions so that we live not for ourselves, but for others. And these virtues, which is really is a way to talk about our moral life, are part, <coughs> excuse me, part of a Christian reality that shows itself in the sacraments. And the sacraments allow us to identify with Jesus, to become his disciples, to continue dining at his table, to continue receiving his mercy, to accept his healing in our lives, and to live in his fidelity. And these actions through the virtues and the sacraments are ways in which we are showing the world what the vision of Christ is and what the kingdom of God is all about. Uh, this is a quote from uh, my book somewhere uh, on the sacraments. Every sacrament is a sign of the kingdom and a step within it. Every sacrament confers grace, as we used to put it, because it situates us more clearly in one or another dimension of the kingdom into which believers have entered through their participation in the church. The sacraments situate us in the kingdom of God more clearly. Every one of the sacraments is a sign of the kingdom. We call them sacraments precisely because they point beyond themselves into a vast vision, which constitutes the ultimate way to interpret human life and human experience. So uh, that's the last thing I wanted to say, <coughs> excuse me, um, today. Thursday, we'll go into a little more, but you can order this book at Paulus Press and uh, you can put in the code, uh, which I sent you, FPDCSP, and you can get a 30% discount on the book. And uh, this is my own website here, fpdciano.com. And then our website here at our office, our evangelization office, PEMDC. So uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, let's see if there's any uh, questions that people have or comments they want to make. Uh, the Q&A is down below, uh, right on the bottom, uh, right next to the uh, logo for participants. And uh, if you would like to ask any questions or make any comments, I invite you to do that at this point. <clears throat> oh, somebody raised his hand. Uh, Carol, uh, would you just uh, type in uh, the Q and A uh, there, and and that would that would make it easier for me to see what it is you'd like to say? Can you type down in the bottom? Or if you want, you can use the chat. <clears throat> Did you want to say something, Carol? No, I got it. Okay. okay. Um, what I want to say is thank you very much. It's probably the clearest explanation that I've heard on uh, the kingdom of God. Sometimes people refer to it as the reign of God. And um, I'm glad that you brought in uh, how our, ex our consciousness is expanding and that we continue that God pulls us into the future. And it, it, it so it meshes with what science is telling the kids in school today about the universe expanding, et cetera. And uh, you just nailed it for me. And I thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. And there's a lot more to see as we continue uh, to reflect on these things. Let me say a little bit about the, uh, the word kingdom and reign. So the Greek word is basileia, and uh, it, it's usually translated as a kingdom. And some theologians feel, well, that means people think of it as a place. And uh, the idea is that the kingdom is not just a place, it's a state of existence. And so that's what they want to say when they say the word uh, uh, reign of God, 
is they're, is they're trying to emphasize that it's a state of life. And another word we could use, and perhaps is better than reign, is the word realm. Like we live within a realm, and it's a state of consciousness, a state of connection, and a state of love. Thank you. Let's see if we get any more comments. Uh, the raising the hand works. So if you want to raise your hand, and then I can uh, click on you, and you, you can make a comment. Or... Um, the, uh, use the Q&A down at the bottom. I would hate to think that, uh, that I put you all to sleep. <clears throat> okay, two participants have raised hands. Let's see how we do here. Uh, yes, Richard, what would you like to say, Richard? Welcome. Are you there? Oh yeah, you have to unmute yourself, Richard. Uh, so go down in the corner where the little microphone is and tap that and that will, that will unmute you and then we can hear what you're saying. You there you up. are. Yeah, we can hear you now, thank you. Yeah, um, when it comes to, uh, when you're talking about the kingdom of God, what exactly like when, when I think it's when Jesus said, the kingdom of God uh, is within you. Yes, uh, and that word within in Greek actually can be translated as among us or between us. So the kingdom is never seen as something that's, you know, uh, like a personal consciousness that I have. It's always connected with the realities around me and, and with the people around me. And uh, um, kingdom is certainly not just a future state, it's also a present state, because we, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are living the kingdom now. We've already begun to live the kingdom. And so, uh, yeah, you know, a, lo a, a lot of Catholicism has tried to make faith into a very kind of private thing. You know, it's me and God, and, and I, I'm going to do good, and I'm going to go to heaven, et cetera. And Jesus never meant that by the word kingdom. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. But okay, I just got one one more question. Are you still there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, one of the things you know, I when um, I think I grew up with, and I don't understand today, is that like in, in the um, uh, the apostle the um, Apostles' Creed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where it says, um, I believe in Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Communion, Saints, Forgiveness, and the resurrection of the body. Yes. Are, are we actually saying the physical body? And, and when we say the physical body, are we also uh, saying that, you know, we are going to eat and drink and use the latrine? And I mean, what is what exactly does the body well you yeah, know uh yes we do mean physical body we don't necessarily mean the actual bodies that we have now or the way our bodies are now i mean think of jesus risen from the dead uh and he deliberately and this will be a gospel i think a week or two from now he deliberately sits down with his disciples he says you have anything to eat and he eats uh and uh you know, we assume that his biological processes were, were intact. And, and, and so I, I think we'd say there is continuity with our present physical state, but there's also discontinuity because there are limitations that we experience bodily now that we will not experience in the future as we see in, in, in his resurrection. I really don't know how bathrooms are going to work in heaven, but I'm sure if, <laughs> if they are there, they'll be a lot more pleasant than our present experiences of, of latrines. So you can maybe write an essay on that, Richard, what, what my heavenly bathroom will look like. And that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Oh, thank you, Father. Good. All right, good. And I think I saw another hand raised. So let's see if I go over here. Um, anybody else have a hand raised? Oh, Tom Ryan, allowed to talk? Yes, Tom. Tom, unmute yourself, Tom. 
Go down to the microphone and click the little microphone. There you are. Now you're ready to click. I am yes. here, Frank, but um, I did not have my hand raised. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, I thought uh, I went down and I saw that. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll, let, I'll let you go in peace. But thank you for participating here. Well, and, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And, and we'll be uh, doing part two. We'll be going into some of the other dimensions of the implications of this uh, spirituality on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll, we'll save the recording and send it to you. Thank you all so much for participating. I wish you a blessed Easter. Wonderful. And I hope as we celebrate this week of Easter, we are seeing this as a celebration of the future that God is bringing about for all of humankind. Amen. Amen. Stop the recording. And yes, the recording stopped.